Welcome everyone to Dworkin and Bernstein's Learn from Leaders virtual series. Uh, this virtual interview has been organized by the Business Management Department at Lakeland Community College. Uh, my name is Gretchen Scope DeSanto. I'm a Business Management Associate Professor here at Lakeland. And on behalf of both myself and my colleague, Department Chair Connie Golden, uh, we're very happy that you're able to uh, join us this afternoon. We've got a great crowd. I think we've got over 50 attendees. So that's great. And it's a beautiful day outside. So A++ for all of you uh, joining us today. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest leader today, Adam Sandin. Adam is the president of Brunner Sandin Dietrich Funeral Home and Cremation Center as he's worked in the family business since uh, 2007. He's responsible for controllership duties, treasury duties, economic strategy, and forecasting of the business. In addition, he manages um, the HR responsibilities for the staff of 20 employees. Now, I just recently met Adam, um, but I have been hearing his name around Lake County for at least a decade, maybe more. Um, he's incredibly involved in a number of um, valuable nonprofit organizations in Lake County. So he definitely gives of his time um, uh, to our community, which is incredibly important. And recently, Adam has gained national attention by speaking to state funeral associations about best practices in the funeral industry. He's also uh, presented to associations in Florida and Illinois and Idaho, just to name a few, um, and where he shares his knowledge and expertise about the business side of the funeral industry. So I'm now going to uh, close this uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, hopefully you all are now just seeing me and Adam and I'm gonna jump into some questions here, Adam. We're gonna maybe do that for the next 25 or so minutes. And then that'll get all of you um, on the line uh, ready to ask your questions, okay? So uh, let's first start off, Adam, if you wouldn't mind giving us a brief history of your career and your entrepreneurial journey. Sure, thanks Gretchen, and I appreciate you having me today. Um, so I was born and raised in Mentor, Ohio. I've been a Lake County uh, person my entire life. Went to Lake Catholic High School, and then shortly after that, I attended Lakeland for two years, and then transferred to John Carroll to finish out my bachelor degree, which is which was in accounting. Uh, I got my master's there in business administration and sat for the CPA exam at the same time that, that was happening. So from there, um, while I was interning at Olympic Steel for about a year during my senior year, um, I was hired by Grant Thornton in public accounting. I worked downtown for just shy of three years. And then came back to the family business in 07, which is where I am today. Um, you know, I think the, uh, the, the, the entrepreneurial side of it <clears throat> was probably from my parents growing up. When, when you own a family business, it's yours to work and, and to run, and nobody else is going to do it for you. Right? So it started with my grandfather, went through my parents, my aunts and my uncles, and then now today down to myself, my brother, and my cousin. Um, the philanthropic side of it, uh, I think it's incredibly important to give back to the place that supports you. And for us, that's Lake County. It's, it's surrounding organizations. And it's not just any one. I mean, some of them are near and dear to my heart based upon personal experience. But, um, you know, how, how can we improve the area where we live, work, and play? I don't think there's any other way than to get involved, both financially, physically, um, and, and to really try and make a difference. So. While that's separate from the business, it really goes hand in hand because the things that we do in the community, you know, it gets our name out there. We shake hands, people know us, and then we're there for them in their time of need when, when a death occurs. So it's kind of come full circle and, and it does work hand in hand when we do those types of things. Thank you. So could you talk a little bit about the benefits of, of owning a business from your perspective? Yeah. Um, so I think first and foremost, the biggest the biggest benefit would be flexibility. I mean, I've got a five and a six year old at home. And um, if you look at where I worked downtown, I spent probably two to three hours awake at home every day. The others were spent at work or commuting to work. And today I probably spend seven to 10 hours at home awake every day where my commute seven minutes to work. If I want to go home for lunch and meet my wife, or my kids when they're not in school, I can. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest ones is flexibility, right, in your own schedule. But uh, I'll tell you that flexibility works both ways. When you own the business, you better be flexible enough to look at your family and say, hey, something came up at work, I gotta go in, when you were expecting to be off. Um, especially a business like ours where there's no really 
you know, nine to five or a 24 seven operation. Uh, there have been times where in the middle of a Christmas meal, uh, we got a call and got up and came into work. And that's that's the part of it in our industry specifically. But really in any industry, if, if, if you're owning the business, you better be willing to do everything that you're asking your staff to do. So along with those benefits, um, there's certainly some challenges, right, in, in small right. business ownership. Um, what are some of those that you've encountered? Let's not talk COVID right now. We're going to get to COVID. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's, that's obviously on everybody's mind. Um, but what are some of the challenges and how have you addressed those? And I, we always love to ask this question because in teaching entrepreneurship, you know, I want my students to, you know, to not necessarily look through this like, you know, rose colored glasses, right? There's going to be the problems. Um, but I want them to learn from those who have done it before, right? Sure. And, and how have folks um, overcome those challenges? So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of that with us, we'd appreciate yeah. it. So every day that I come in, I think, I think there's a, a daily challenge and it's the same every day. And it's, what are you doing to make sure that your staff is taken care of, feels good about the culture that they're working in, is well compensated and isn't gonna leave uh, for one of those reasons. My, my, I operate by the two C's every single day, cash and culture. And I'll never lose an employee because of either one of those two things. And if I focus on that, making sure that they're well compensated, they can take care of their families, can put food on the table, and the culture is good, they feel comfortable coming to work, those things are very important to me. But that's the biggest challenge that I face every day because I got 20 people, all with different personalities, all, the, all working in a very emotional industry, dealing with people that are coming to us at their worst times, they're not happy to be here. And I've got to get them motivated and, and engaged and really happy to be here, to be helping these families every single day. Um, so certainly dealing with the managing management of the staff, uh, the HR side of it is 100% the hardest thing every day, but it's also the most rewarding because I've got a staff and I would be, I would be comfortable to send every single one of them into your class in front of your students and they would all repeat what I just said. None of them will leave here because of cash or culture. If they have an issue at home, personal preference, they're moving across town, whatever, you can't control that. But if you take the challenge of managing your staff head on, making sure that they're taken care of, it's going to go a long way to you continuing into the future. Thank you. So now you mentioned it's a family business. You said yep. your cousin is in the business. You say your brother. Yeah, so the current partners are my brother, Jason, my cousin, Brian, my uncle, Chuck, and my mom, Nancy. Okay, so that big family. Everybody's involved in the business. Now, I'll tell you, if I had something like that with my family, oh, no, no, somebody would have killed somebody by now. There'd be family fist fights. Okay, can you share with us, you know, the, the benefits and challenges of being in a multi-generational family business? How does yeah. that work? Yeah, I mean, it's... You know, it's great. So the, the, the perks and the, and the quote unquote fringe benefits that we get as being partners, you know, we've all got company cars that are, are used for the funeral home, but we also get to drive them home at night. So things like that, you know, the cell phones are paid for, the health insurance is paid for. It's great, right? Everything's great. Um, but working with your family is a grind. Uh, you know, you get into a situation where you have an argument at work and that argument between, let's just say myself and my mom is different than an argument between yourself and a boss when in the family, right? It, it, it just gets personal, it just does, because that's the way family business is. Well, Murphy's Law tells you that that argument happens on December 24th before you leave work. And tomorrow, you're going over to her house for Christmas dinner with the kids and the wife, and it just, it's very difficult. Now, I will say that we've gotten really good over the past 10 years um, at really driving home the culture around here. It's gotten markedly better. We still struggle every once in a while, and every family business does, but uh, the, we've, we've made a very, very conscious decision to have a culture around here that's based on accountability, right, and attention to detail. And it doesn't matter whether your name's on the sign out front or not. Everybody is held to that same standard. Everybody treats each other with respect. Everybody has each other's back. And when we remember that, we all of a sudden start operating like a business that just happens to be a thing. And it works very well. Um, you know, the flexibility that I mentioned earlier, it's pretty nice. Um, you know, the family members can, can, can be flexible, but it's important to remember that you can't take advantage of that because the staff remembers it. So what do we do? 
we offer that same flexibility to our staff. I tell my staff all the time, uh, if you have young children and you miss any of their special events, I'm going to fire you. Because I don't want anybody working here that's not there for their kids, you know, first baseball game or dance recital or baptism. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud to say that that type of attitude and culture is why my turnover is significantly uh, less than my counterparts in the same industry. I, mean, I haven't lost uh, an employee who quit on their own uh, in probably four to five years today. And, and in the past 10 years, there's probably only been two. Wow. So it's, it's hard. It's, it's a challenge. Um, but if you're up for that challenge, the benefits of owning it um, are way, way, way higher than the costs. So now I'm ready to talk COVID. Yeah. Okay. What obviously your industry is right at you know, the center, I guess, of, of, of part of this. And, and it's been a significant impact on what you do, particularly, you know, in that March, April, May timeframe when you couldn't have in-person um, funerals, et cetera. So can you tell us how, you know, you've adapted to the challenges of doing business during COVID? Maybe give us some specific examples and how you've been able to pivot or potentially grow during this time? Yeah, so just a, a real quick background. So if you come to our funeral home, you can do everything here on site. You can have a funeral, you can buy a headstone, you can uh, pre-plan your funeral, your crematory. We have a crematory on site, so that happens here. Uh, we have a reception hall that holds 125 people. That happens here. Uh, so literally, if you came here for a service, you wouldn't have to leave until it was time for you to go home. Well, that all changed when COVID hit. So what used to be a you know, visitation on a Wednesday night would lead to the funeral on Thursday morning. And then they would come back here and, and eat in our reception center and drink and two hours of, of camaraderie. And then they'd go home, turned into, well, uh, mom or dad or grandma or grandpa died and we want to have a funeral. Okay, come on in. We'd make arrangements with them. 99% of the information was gathered over the phone or on a web call like we're on now. They'd come in, sign the contract. We would meet them at the cemetery, bury their loved one, and they'd go home. Everything else was was out the window. Uh, now, for a business like ours, you know what is what does that do to us? Well, um, you know, a normal burial in today's market costs anywhere between ten and fifteen thousand bucks. It can be more or less based upon the casket, but that would be average across the industry for a full burial, a visitation, and a church service, and all of that. Well, all of a sudden, you know. They're not buying a nice casket because nobody's going to see it at visitation. They're not buying flowers to put on the casket. You're not selling the room for four hours. And our margins went in the tank for about six months. So PPP certainly helped us. I applied for it, got it. And I'm very happy to say that I was able to keep all 20 employees uh, paid. Even the hourly employees who weren't working, I paid them their average uh, hourly rate uh, that they had worked for the past year. I kept paying them. Um, it worked. So, you know, that was the biggest issue that we ran into. How did we pivot and what changes did we make? Um, from the reception side, you know, we actually started going to box lunches and we brought that up in front of the families and said, hey, instead of a full blown catered event with your normal fare, right? Your beef tenderloin, your, your chicken, your green beans, almond bean, and your salad, we can do a box lunch and we can do sandwiches, we can do something a little more fancy. What do you like? And what we soon found out is the families really enjoyed the ability to have that food and take it home and still enjoy the food and fellowship at their house versus, hey, we can't do anything. So, you know, did it replace our margins completely? No, but we were still making a little bit of money and I had way less labor into it. You know, for a hundred person event, I got six people up here for five hours. That's 30 man hours. I got one person on a phone for about 45 minutes ordering box lunches and then that's it. And they get delivered, the family takes them home, everybody's happy. So that was one uh, big issue. Um, you know, the WebEx calls and the arrangements over the phone were another one. People were giving us a lot of the information about their loved ones, you know, prior to coming in. So when they came in, well, what's normally an hour and a half or two hour arrangement conference turned into a 15 minute sign here and, and away we go. So uh, those were some of the biggest issues. The, the hardest thing was obviously the, the meetings 
that the families couldn't have, right? So the families, hey, I want to bring in, you know, seven people to the arrangement conference because they all love grandma. Well, we're limiting it to one. Um, so you'll need to tell the other six that, that they need to come to the cemetery tomorrow instead of coming to the arrangement conference today. Um, those are hard conversations to have, but we were, you know, the whole the whole way we made a decision to follow the governor's orders, whether we agreed with them or not, and that's what we did. Okay, thank you. So we have a number of students um, listening today who either currently running, you know, a small business, so they got you know a side hustle, yep. uh, that maybe they can turn into a you know a, 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 a small business, um, or they're thinking down the road this is something that could be for me. What's the best advice that you would give those students? Oh man, uh, <clears throat> so the best advice I ever got, and and it's true, and I'll pass it along is. If you come to work every day and you're comfortable, you're you're not doing what you need to be doing. You got to get out of your comfort zone. Every single time I'm out of my comfort zone. <clears throat> and it drives me nuts because I like things being in a square box. Like I come to work, I like my spreadsheets being neat, right? Um, so when things aren't really neat and tidy, I, I, I'm, I'm all scattered. But I soon realized that the time immediately following that, right, when I'm, when I'm back into my comfort zone, I realized that I learned more during that time when I was out of my comfort zone and I made more progress than I do otherwise. And it's because you're doing things that need to be done that maybe you wouldn't normally do. But when you get out, you know, when you're able to look in hindsight, right, you realize that had to be done and it furthered my business one way or the other. Um, you know, the other bit of advice is, you know, um, your staff, right? I train them very well. I train them very well. We go through some rigorous training. I make sure they know. I make sure my maintenance guy knows why we're going to the cemetery with a certain type of casket and a certain type of ball. Even though he'll never be in that position, he's part of the team and he needs to know that. So I treat them so well that they can leave and go to any other funeral home and get a job. That's how well I train them. I treat them so well that they never will leave. And I saw that quote once probably 10 years ago, and I went, I'm, that's going to be my mission. I want everybody here to have so much knowledge that they can go on and do whatever they want. And then I'm going to treat them so well that they would never think of doing that. And that's how I've, we've become so successful over the past, you know, 70 plus years in business. It's just taking care of your staff. Um, and then finally, you know, COVID was a big example of this, um, being aggressive when others aren't. You know, when, when the majority is are just fearful, sitting back and not doing a whole lot. Um, you know, what did we do? We bought the strip next door as an extension of our of our funeral business. And in that strip, uh, you know, we bought it in the middle of COVID when nobody was renting and it was vacant. There's five units in it. We put a flower shop in there that now supplies 100% of the flowers for our funeral home. Uh, there's, a, there's a ladies boutique. So if somebody needs to go over and get clothed before the service they can uh there's a there's a jewelry and loan so if you need to if you need to trade in you know mom dad grandma's old jewelry they can help you liquidate the estate after the death has occurred there's a catering company so they can cater your after funeral event if uh you need that and then the last one is a bar um and we're actually they're going to open here shortly and we're going to have our, our company christmas party over there to support them shortly yeah. but we did that all in the middle of a global pandemic when everybody else was thinking I need this stimulus money and I'm going to bank it and sit on it so nothing happens. Um, those are the three biggest things. Treat your staff well, be aggressive when others uh, aren't, right? And get out of your comfort zone. You've got to get out of your comfort zone in order to be uh, successful in life and in business. Thank you. Now, I think you may have answered this question already because um, you've given us a, lot to think about already, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway, in case you want to add something else. What do you consider to be some leadership best practices in business? I know you've talked about the importance of culture and getting out of your comfort zone, but do you have anything else to add? Um, you know, I, I think just setting the tone when you're the leader, whether you're the president, uh, and I wasn't the president until uh, last, last summer, but, um, you know, I was pretty much running the business and the staff knew if there was an issue, they were coming to me. Setting that tone and setting the example and letting them know 
hey, this is the way we're going to do it. You can't just say, hey, we're going to improve the culture and accountability and then do something completely opposite, right? They've got to be watching you lead. And I do that every day. So, you know, there's times when I'm outside pulling weeds. There's times when I'm out downstairs washing a car. There's times when I'm checking in caskets from the delivery guy. Like, you got to be willing to do it all. So, you know, improving the culture, setting the tone, right? And um, really just making an investment in your staff. If you forget everything I say today and you want to be successful in business, find a staff and treat them like your family, whether they are or not. If you do that, you're going to be 90% of the way there. So we're talking family. You brought it up. Um, let's talk work-life balance a little bit. You mentioned how you have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. You're running a business. You're all involved in the community. Um, and then there's this theme out in the world now about you know, mental health. And we can burn, you know, the, the candle at both ends. Um, and we never escape, you know, this thing. You know, work is always there. Um, so do you have any suggestions of, uh, for the folks listening today about making sure you have that healthy balance between all the different balls that you're juggling? Um, do you have any wise advice for us? Yeah, so uh, interestingly enough, I, um, I and my mother just started stepping back from some of the boards that we had done. And it was because my mom was missing time with the grandkids and I was missing time with my son and my daughter. Um, and what I realized, I didn't do this so well when they were first born, and I regret it. Um, but I literally started scheduling stuff on my work schedule for my kids, whether they had an event or not. Like it was an appointment, and just like another important event, that's not getting canceled or moved. If somebody would call to say, hey, are you available at this time? I'm not. Tied up, what can I do? And that's given me the opportunity to then say, hey, uh, so I can get out of here at 3 o'clock today so I can be home and be with the kids till we eat dinner versus getting home at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. The kids have already eaten. They're getting ready for you know fast time. And then I don't spend any time with them. And that goes for my wife, too. Uh, you know, making time to spend with her has become a a task on my calendar so I know this is the time I can do. Stepping back from some of the nonprofit boards that I'm on has has helped that. Um, you know, I had a lot of morning meetings and now I don't have any. So every day I get to take my kids to school. I do that on the way to work. Um, so that's, you know, a 20 or 30 minute, you know, job that I enjoy getting them out the door and we sit in line and I drop them off and that's very important to me. Um, but I, I just think it's, you have to take it just as important as that two o'clock appointment or that meeting with the vendor, uh, because that vendor's not going to be there forever. And neither is that a two o'clock appointment, but those kids are. And I've watched, you know, other people. And when I was working downtown in public accounting, you know, they're workaholics, which is a great thing, right? You have a great work ethic. You're always willing to do it. But all of a sudden, and I remember the day for me, my, my son was four and my daughter was three. And I went, I'm missing way too much. My, my wife would be texting me, you know, she took her first steps. He's out throwing the football around with the neighbor. And I'm like, that needs to be me. So I just, I really changed a lot that I was doing. And I've given them time on my schedule. And it, I don't deviate from it. Once it's on there, it's on there. Thank you. So if you were to do one thing differently in business or your professional career, what would it be? Oh, man. Um, like, but like, are you saying, but I'm still here at the funeral home or anything in life? Anything, anything. I, I, I'd probably still be working at the funeral home, but when I was working downtown, I would have gotten my law degree in addition to my CPA. Uh, uh, I, gradu I graduated from John Carroll right about the same time that the whole Enron fiasco went down. And, uh, you know, JDs with a CPA license were getting paid a whole lot of money back then. Yeah. Uh, so plus I enjoyed law. I, I enjoyed, you know, arguing and negotiating and challenging people. So I probably would have gotten my law degree. I have a similar regret. Um, I actually did one year of law school and it didn't work out for me. And I think I look back and I'm like, why? I think I was I was too afraid. You know, I was too afraid that I, I'd, I'd fail. And now, you know, talking about that, you know, get outside of your comfort zone. I just should have embraced it, you know. So I'm with you. Maybe we go back together. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait till my kids are a little older. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, I've got two more questions. So a heads up to everybody on the line. We're gonna get to your questions here in a couple of minutes. I only have two more I wanna ask. So start typing those in the chat box if you have them. Don't wanna forget them. Uh, what's one piece of advice you would tell your younger self? Oh, um, man, there's a lot, there's a lot of advice. <laughs> um, I would say, I would, I would say, get out of my comfort zone, take the risk, go to law school. Okay. Right. I mean, you know, and I think you can apply that to anything, but take the risk. If you're sitting there right now in, in Gretchen's class thinking, what should I do? Do it. Man, when you're young, you can afford to fail. You can afford financially to fail. You can afford with time to fail. You have time to rebound. You could try a hundred different things. And if they all fail, you're still most likely in your twenties, right? I mean, you may have some older folks, but mo most of them are probably young. I wish I would have taken the risks that I'm taking now. 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah. When you have a whole lot less to lose, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a whole lot less to lose. Okay. Final question. Best business decision you ever made? Oh, man. Um, there's two of them. Uh, one is I changed the complete model of the funeral business here in 2012. And if you've ever been to a funeral home, uh, you know, what you guys don't see on the backside is all of those people there <clears throat> pretty much do everything. So all the funeral directors, I mean, they're seeing families, they're embalming, they're setting up flowers, they're washing cars, anything that needs done. That's just how the funeral industry works, right? Um, well, <coughs> excuse me, it took me about two years worth of gathering data to realize that I had some people that were really good at sales. Some people that were really good at, at, at funeral directing, putting their arm around the family and walking through that process with them, going to the church, going to the cemetery. I had one guy who was really, really good at embalming, and he was gaining national attention from some of the trade magazines. Um, so I sat down with the staff and I said, you guys all need to know that some of you aren't going to make arrangements anymore. Some of you aren't going to run funerals anymore. Some of you aren't going to embalm anymore. And it took a minute. They were like, what are you talking about? Said, We've been doing this for 50 years. And I said not going to happen it's costing us money it's not efficient and it's not best for the families that we're serving uh, ultimately what is what, what happened well that was back in 2012. we've had other than one year um, we've had increasing profit every single year for nine years our call value has gone down 10 percent and we've still made more money our families are happier than ever we survey all of our families and we have about a about a 50% response rate. Um, the staff here is happier than ever, and the business itself is more solid than it's ever been in the history of the company. Um, so that that change is, you know, it just it made everything better. Everybody's happy. Everybody's in places where they want to be. We're putting square pegs in square holes, and round pegs in round holes. It just makes sense. And then the last part um, was we invested in real estate. We started back in 2010, and uh, we bought the building next door and we put a, a real estate office in there. So if a you know, loved one dies and we need to sell their house, we can send them right next door. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, I built a building for Lighthouse Advisors uh, right behind that uh, Remax building. And uh, you know, somebody needs help with liquidating grandpa or grandma's 401k or getting you know their cash together to pay for the services, we can send them over there and they can help with that. Above Lighthouse, is a full service salon. So if you come here and have to, you know, hey, I'm from out of town. I want to get my hair and nails done before the funeral. We can send you over there and get that done. And then again, the building next door that we just bought during COVID, uh, the flowers, the catering, I mean, everything, um, it worked out perfectly. And those were big risks to take um, because I hate debt. But it's that's 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 a powerful tool if you use it appropriately. And uh, it's really worked out well for us. Um, you know, I'm continuing to look for options to, to invest in real estate, but it's a uh, it's a really, really good opportunity for you to increase your retirement, right? Increase the amount you make during retirement, reduce the amount of time you have to work if you can have solid real estate investment options in addition to whatever savings you've had during your, your time. So that's what we're doing. I think that's excellent advice. That is the end of my question. So we want to hear from all of you on the line today. 
what questions do you have? Um, I will start with one, to Connie, just because I don't mean to steal your thunder, but there is one sitting in the chat box right in front of me. So this is from Joseph. Um, Adam, how do you cope with the mental stress of your job? Wow, great, great question. Um, I wasn't always real good at it. And uh, I was going home, I'd have headaches, my neck would hurt, my back would hurt. My wife would say, it's too stressful, what do you do? Um, so two options. One, I over communicate with my partners. I think the biggest issue that we were having, especially as a family business was, you know, people were, were leaving here going, well, Adam's doing this or Jason's doing that or Chuck's doing that. Well, you know, that's my uncle, I'm their, I'm their nephew. It's not like a, a respectful environment if you're treating it like that. So we meet daily at 8.30 in the morning and then we meet once a month, just the partners for about an hour. We talk about everything. What are you, what are you happiest with? What's, how's the business going? How's your life at home? Is everything good? And what that's done is it's allowed us to not go home and you know think in the back of your mind, well, what are they all thinking? Why, why did my uncle do that? Or why did my cousin do that? You don't have to think it anymore because you know, hey, it wasn't intentional. They, they screwed up, they made a mistake. Uh, the other thing that I do is I get outside and, and, and do some type of activity at least once a day for a half hour where I try and leave my phone behind and, and not answer emails or phone calls or text messages. I'm not very good at that. My wife will tell you. Uh, I, you know, I tell her I'm not going to leave, my, you know, take my phone, but I, I generally always slip it into my pocket, or, or you know, I'll respond to a text or a, an email. But whether it's fishing with my son, shooting hoops with the neighbor, uh, you know, walking alongside my daughter who's riding her bike, you got to get out and decompress for some amount of time each day, or you're going to go crazy. And I was for a while, but I've gotten much better at. It. Thank you. So a reminder to everybody, we're taking questions now. Please type them in the Q&A box and you can send them to all panelists. OK, that type those in the Q&A box. Uh, Connie, do you have some questions? I do have questions. So I'm going to start with Diamond's question because I think she's putting um, she's making lemonade out of lemons and she wants to know um, how COVID has had a positive impact on the world, on the business world from your perspective. Man, I, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> excuse me. The one thing that we noticed uh, was after 72 years of being in business, we thought we had it figured out, right? We, we thought, hey, we know how to run a funeral home. We've been doing it so long. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of things that we do differently today that have both decreased expenses, increased revenue, and increased overall morale of the workforce. I mean, things like, you know, being able to log in from home. If, if something needs done, you know, it's hard for us because when somebody passes away, we have to come in and meet with them. But the ability to come in a little late, leave a little bit early, um, you know, the box lunch example that I gave earlier, we would have never in a million years thought that we, there's no way we're offering a box lunch. We are a first class funeral home. It's not going to happen. And that was our own, you know, prejudging of that scenario. And the families love it. They love being able to take that box lunch home with them. And for us, it, it made, the profit on that event was like $5 short of profit on an event where we worked our tails off to serve 100 people on site. It was a miracle. So I think just seeing things through a different lens, being forced to do things that you wouldn't have chosen to do on your own, and you soon realize that, okay, we can do this. Great. Um, I think that that your uh, two C's approach is has resonated with people, um, but we have a question about what specifically do you do to motivate your um, employees? You talked about like a Christmas party. I mean, are there things that you could give it specific examples? Yeah, sure. So uh, my employees, um, I mean, there's a long list. Um, there's a there's a company holiday party. There's a quarterly bonus. Um, all of them are paid about 30 to 40% higher than my competitors in the area. Uh, there is, we have season tickets to the Browns, to the Cavs, and to the Indians. Um, there is um, a pile of gift cards in the drawer behind me that I walk around and hand out for some, hey, I, I see somebody pick up a, a, a Kleenex that's blown through the parking lot, great. I see somebody walk out and greet a family at their car because it's raining with an umbrella and they're bringing in their you know, the grandma's ashes because they want us to transform into an urn. Okay, there you go, right? Um, they all get a birthday card with a gift card in it, hand signed by the five partners with a handwritten note from me. 
Uh, if they do something special, they'll get a phone call or a handwritten thank you letter from me. Um, I, I know all of their spouses' names. I know all of their kids' names. I take a real uh, specific investment in their families. And I care. I truly, truly care about that. I had one lady um, several years back whose son was going through an issue with drugs. And I went down and looked at her and said, you need to take some time off. It's going to be fully paid. I'm not going to use up your vacation for it. Just go. When you can come back, come back. So she did. And I mean, you'll, you'll have a lifelong advocate for your business if you treat your employees like that. And it's not about money, right? We spend more money on staff today than we ever have before. But as I said to Gretchen earlier, we're more profitable today than we ever have been before. So, so, so it's the biggest thing you can do. Take care of your staff, right? Don't, you know, d don't run a business thinking that, well, it's my name on the sign. So I should, I should make, you know, 500 grand a year while they make 50 grand a year. It's not fair. I don't care whether it's your name on the sign or not. You're going to get way farther and make more money and be more successful and be around longer if you take care of that, that staff. And they're going to talk about it. The staff is all talking about how well they get treated. Right? And you can't stop. We do it all the time. We sponsor things that they're involved in, whether or not they have anything to do with the funeral home. You know, I just sponsored a bowling team out of Wickless. Is one of my guys that works at the door for visitation said, my wife's on this polling team. Will you sponsor their T-shirts? Of course I will. Where do I send the check? And it's just things like that where <clears throat> they know that I've got their back every day because I know that they have my back every day and they're going to take care of the families. Nice. Um, we have a question that's focused on leadership. Um, what behaviors or attributes would you say are the most essential for distinguishing great leaders from good leaders? Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's a pretty broad line, to be honest with you. Uh, and I, I think it just goes back to setting the tone and, and leading by example, right? So treating the staff like you would want to be treated and ultimately giving them the ability to grow and show you what they can do not micromanaging them, right? You hire them for a reason, let them do the job. And most importantly, letting them fail. I've learned more about how to run this business from bad decisions I've made than from good ones. You're gonna fail. I don't care if you're opening up a small uh, juice box in a restaurant or a fine dining restaurant or a multi-million dollar corporation, you're gonna fail. It's, every day I realize that, oh, I did that. Oh, I did that wrong. And some of them are just, little things. Some of them are bigger. Some of them I got to call my attorney on and say, what the heck did I just do? But you learn from them all, right? And you've got to be willing to allow your staff to do the same thing. And if you're not, right, uh, you know, if you use the word me a lot, I, you know, I would take a hard look in the mirror and, and figure out why you're saying those words, because it's not about you at all. It's that, you know, I tell my staff all the time, the three names on the sign out front aren't the most important ones. The 17 names that I put on paychecks every two weeks are the most important ones. Because without them, the three names on the sign go away. It's that, it's, it's that simple. Great. So we have a question, um, and, and I know you mentioned law school, but did you always want to be involved in the funeral business? And was there anything else you thought you would have liked to be doing? So uh, the, the answer to the first part is yes. I always knew I would be back here in the, in the family business. It wasn't until that uh, I took an accounting class my senior year at Lake Catholic, and then I had Jim Rasick at Lakeland for a couple of years, that I knew when I went back to the family business, it wasn't going to be as a funeral director at all, because the rest of my family, that's all they do. So I knew, I knew that I'd have no credibility going back there without a funeral director's license or an embalming license, unless I went and got licensed, uh, you know, in the state of Ohio. So that's when I decided, all right, I'm gonna go into public accounting, I'm gonna get my CPA license, I'm gonna spend two or three years outside in the workforce and then go back with experience that they don't have. So uh, you know, that's that's the first part of, of the question. The second, it'd be, it'd be law. I, w I mean, I, I could see myself in a courtroom going back and forth with a prosecutor I think I'd be good at it. Okay. Sorry, just going through here. 
Um, in your advice, you mentioned taking the risk. In doing so, you have most likely experienced some losses. How did you recover from the losses? I never put up more than I can afford to lose. And, you know, from a financial perspective, right, it was easy. I have, I have failed uh, multiple times. In fact, the, build, the building that we first bought, we had dumped about 30,000 bucks into it to get it ready to be something that ultimately it, it didn't end up being. It wasn't supposed to be a real estate office. Um, so that 30 grand, we didn't get back. Um, but we knew that, hey, you know, that's a lesson we learned. And it was our first foray into real estate and we took it on the chin, but we've made it back uh, in multiples since then. Um, in terms of like a, a physical loss or, or time loss, I think that's actually more important than than the money part of it, right? Like we spent so much time and effort getting this ready for what we thought it was gonna be. And then it turned out not to be. And it, it kind of defeats you a little bit, but um, you know, like I said earlier, the, the attitude of learning from your failures, I did. I, I, I came back to my office that day sat at my desk and my dad was still part of the company at the time and I said, all right, let's 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 hash this out and make sure that we never go down this road again. And we haven't. We learned from it. We knew exactly what we did wrong. And since then we've we've made the correct decision every step of the way. Good. We have a question. Um, do you enjoy the work that you do? And do you have any advice for starting a business with doing something you enjoy? You, you better enjoy it or don't start the business. I, I love, absolutely love what I do. You know, you hear the the, the cliche, right? Uh, you know, do something you love and you'll never go to work a day in your life. Well, okay, that's great, but let's be honest. We all go to work, right? It, it's not always roses, um, but I, I love what I do. The business aspect of it is becoming less and less because I've been doing it so long that it just kind of runs itself. I have a lot of processes in place that, that handle most of it. And we're still a relatively small business. So I can get, I can do the books, you know, in about 10 hours a week. So that frees up, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week to go out and make sure that my tenants are all good. Um, you know, gives me time to go out to lunch with my wife and my kids. Um, but I love, it. I love the flexibility. I love working with my staff. I love, I love the hard parts too, dealing with a family who's going through a loss. Um, you know, and, and getting through that process with them and having them write you a card in the back end saying, you made an unbearable situation bearable, thank you. Like, you literally just lost somebody and you thanked me. That's a pretty cool feeling to have. Um, but really, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy, I enjoy every day coming to work, um, learning something new. Um, I enjoy the grind, I enjoy the challenge. I enjoy being part of the community, going out and serving on boards and doing things that, that you know, not just a nine to five, come in, do the same thing, and then go home. That's great. The, the advice to, you know, person starting the business, you've got to love it. You've got to love it or you're going to get burned out because it's not going to go smoothly. You're not, you're not going to open your doors and make $10 million and retire in three years. You're going to grind the first several years of your business to get it up and going. And if you don't love it, if you don't wake up looking forward to, hey, what can I do different today to attract more customers, treat my staff better, make more money, you're never gonna last. Are you planning to expand on the practices you have had to incorporate due to COVID? For example, offering virtual funeral services to large families. Yep, so we've, we've already invested in cameras and we do some webcasting. So a lot of the families that request it can, can view their loved one's funeral ceremony on their obituary, which is on our website. Forever, it's, it's housed there forever, it'll never, never go away. Uh, we're gonna continue to offer the box lunches. We're gonna phase back in sit down meals if they if they choose to want it. But so far, we've seen 90 plus percent say, no, I'll just take it home with me, it's great. Um, you know, in terms of other things, the virtual arrangements, we continue to offer that, but our what we're seeing is that people still prefer to come in face to face, and when they're selecting a casket or a vault or flowers, they want to see it. They want to touch it. They want to be here, and and I think what we're what we're noticing is that because it's so emotional for a lot of them, you know, to sit in front of a computer, it, it kind of puts that that you know morale or the um, 
the rapport building, it, it puts a damper on it. You can't really get to know your funeral director who's going to take care of your mom for the next three days and then have your funeral service and take you to the church and go to the cemetery. So I think just because of the industry in general, people are gravitating towards coming back in and, and having that connection face-to-face -face versus, you know, over the phone or, or via a web call. Okay. So Jim Rasick is not only an accounting professor, he's also an animal lover. And he has a question regarding pet cremation. Do you see that as a growth area or is it too low of margins? Uh, he answered his own question. I was going to say he would love this answer. We've looked into it, and the mar the margins are way too low for the cost. There, there's a uh, funeral home across town, Dijon, which we, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, Ross and uh, Ross the Third, they they run a great organization over there, and they actually do pet, pet cremation. But uh, the the analysis that we did here um, to put in a separate unit because you have to use a different crematory for pets than you do for humans. Uh, you know the initial startup cost and the investment doesn't justify the the income that, that we take. Uh, our payback period on that would be about 97 years. Okay. <laughs> As a partner, do you directly manage your staff or have you set up different uh, different management structure? And in what ways do you feel that your approach is successful? So I think it's successful because I do not directly manage them. I run a staff meeting once a month and then the day the 830 staff meeting is run by my office manager carrie and <clears throat> each person knows um you know in each little silo so like jeff's my embalming room manager jason's my granite and, and monument manager carrie's the office manager they all handle the things in their own areas and they deal with problems so um you know if i have a staff member in my office or if i'm stepping into something saying hey what's going on here it's because there is there's an issue Maybe somebody has an issue that the manager wasn't comfortable making a decision on, so they brought it to me. But other than that, I don't get involved. You know, they're all they're all very smart individuals, and they have their own responsibilities, and they don't need me micromanaging them. So they they do their own thing, and they'll come to me if they need help. And to answer the second part of that question, I think that's why it's so successful. Because I'm I sit in my office, I, I do my thing, I go to my meetings, I go home. If I don't hear from them. I assume no news is good news and the place is running well. And generally speaking, that's true. I know that you said earlier that you kind of always knew you would be in the funeral business, but we do have a question about, did you have any other entrepreneurial experience outside of the family business? And then how did you decide that you wanted to be in the family business? Um, so my entrepreneurial experience started when me and my brother at nine and ten years old uh my grandfather had an old uh giant orange snowblower then he and he was no longer snowblowing his driveway so he gave it to my dad and we started <laughs> excuse me snowblowing my neighbor's driveway for 10 bucks and we lived in a development with probably 150 houses yeah maybe it wasn't that big i was young maybe 100 but Word got out and people started calling my parents back in the days of no cell phones. And, you know, your students probably don't understand that, but uh, they call the house line and leave a message on our answering machine. You know, every day it was more and more. Jason and I would get home during the winter from school and, you know, it, it would be, hello, Adam, this is Mrs. You know, Smith down the street. I'm at 6241 Hidden Hollow. Can you come snow blow my driveway? And we'd go and then we'd knock on the door and they'd hand us 10 bucks. Before you knew it, this little nine year old and 10 year old kid, I mean, and it, every winter we would make two or three thousand bucks and then we'd chop it in half and split it up at nine years old. So we did that for probably four or five winters and then started working at the funeral home. Uh, we actually took a pay cut to come work here. My dad was, you know, paying us out of petty cash, like two bucks an hour. Uh, <clears throat> we were doing the same thing here snow blowing the drives, pulling weeds, cutting the grass, washing the cars. Um, you know, so that's kind of where it started, and it was just a work ethic. My parents raised us, you know, if you want something, go get it. Nobody's going to hand you a thing. Uh, so I think that's where it stemmed from. And then really it just got, you know, went down into um, getting my license, going to work. I worked at Olympic Steel. You know, that's a, that's a large company with eight divisions all up and down the eastern part of the United States, and I was running the, a consolidated daily financial statement every day 
from all eight divisions and then introducing that to the CFO. Uh, you talk about getting out of your comfort zone. I, I'm at school at John Carroll and I got a dude making millions of dollars calling me going, what do you think about our finances? And I'm going, I don't have a clue. I just clicked the button, right? So, um, you know, you soon realize that in any situation that you're in, most of the people alongside of you are just as uncomfortable as you are. And when you, when you really believe that, you walk in, you know, some days you fall flat on your face and some days you don't. The days that you don't are the days that could be life-changing. Great. What is the future for funeral homes and how are you adapting? If anybody's got the answer to that question, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> biggest trend that we're seeing right now is cremation is increasing. About 20 years ago, uh, we were burying 70% of the people that we served and we were cremating 30. Today, that's just the opposite. We're cremating 70% and burying 30%. And the margins on cremation are way smaller than the margins on burial. So, what we've had to do, uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, our profits have increased every year for the past nine years. And it's because of the model we changed where we put the salespeople in the sales role, and the funeral people in the funeral role, and the embalming guy in the embalming role. Um, that's very important. What I think you're going to see is I think people that don't differentiate. So, as I said earlier, we offer granite, we offer food, we offer uh, real estate, we offer financial services, everything right here. It, the small mom and pop funeral homes that don't offer those types of things are probably going to get scooped up by some of the large national firms that will just come in, offer them money they can't refuse, and then literally close them down. And what they'll do is they'll pick you know, eight or 10 funeral homes in that. Uh, location, pick the one that they know is, is best, buy nine others, shut them all down, which drives everybody to that one that they leave open. And uh, it's pretty standard. They've been doing that for many, many years now. Uh, we've actually been approached multiple times by our firm. We haven't sold, obviously. I have no plans to. Um, but, you know, to, to answer the question, where, where are they going? I think they're going away unless you have uh, business mindset to differentiate what you're doing. And if you don't, I think you're just losing. We're seeing, you know, if you read obits, you'll notice that a lot of people are saying, we're gonna go have a, a celebration of life at, you know, whatever, La Vera or La Malfa or the Holiday Inn on 306. They don't even need a funeral home involved. They, they, they use the funeral home for the cremation, they take mom's ashes home, and then they go and have a party. And I promise you, they're spending more rent in the hall and, and the food and the booze that they did on the cremation. So those are the types of things that if you don't offer it, they're gonna go spend it somewhere else. And I think we're getting down. We have um, one final question. I think this is a good place to, to kind of wind it up. Seeing that you are in a family business that is dealing with people at their most vulnerable, how did your family help prepare you for that type of experience? So, <clears throat> You, you're never going to be prepared for it until you live it. And at this point, I've been part of it so long that I, I hate to use this word, but you become numb to it. I don't mean numb in a bad way. I mean, you're able to keep your emotions in check enough to really take care of that family because, you know, they're coming in relying on you. You can't start crying or getting emotional when the family starts crying or getting emotional. And that took me a very long time. I used to when I was young. Um, you know, when I was working around here pulling weeds and, and washing cars, I would occasionally help on a funeral, whether it was driving a limousine uh, to the cemetery or helping out in visitation. And you see the family start crying, and I would be standing there thinking to myself, how am I going to stop this tear from my right eye dripping down my cheek? My parents were very good educators in terms of, listen, it's an emotional time. We know that. But it's an honor to serve this family, right? And we're their professionals. We have to be their professionals. You know, we're their funeral directors. We have to direct them. We have to lead them. We have to let them know exactly what's going to happen now, and whether it's right, whether it's wrong, where are we going, why are we doing this. And if we're emotional, we can't effectively do our job. So, you know, it's not that we don't care. We care deeply. We take what we do very, very seriously. But at the end of the day, you're coming here and we have a service to do. And we can't do that if we're not, you know, if we're emotional. So we try our best, doesn't always work, but 
um, I can tell you that uh, what we're doing here, um, you know, matters. And I truly believe that. I truly believe, you know, we're one of the best, not only not only locally, but probably in the, in the nation. I think I would put my staff up against anybody uh, in terms of the quality of service that we provide and the manner in which we provide it. Well, thank you for answering all those questions and thank you to everyone for asking all those wonderful questions. I'll turn it back to Gretchen. Yeah, so a reminder to all of you, make sure you complete our uh, survey that will pop up in your browser after you exit today. And the winners of our gift certificates will be notified by email tomorrow. We also want to thank Dworkin and Bernstein for sponsoring our Learn From Leaders uh, events. And a, uh, a heads up to all of you, we have another uh, Learn From Leaders, which is scheduled for November 9th at 12.30 p.m. That's with Veronica Isabel Dahlberg. She's the founder and executive director of Ola, Ohio. So, Adam, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we're so proud to call you a, a former Lakeland student. Um, I know Jim certainly is with all the success that you've seen. So thank you for sharing your time and expertise. And uh, thanks for everybody uh, joining us today. We hope you uh, have a wonderful rest of the day.